Today we're going to take a look at an interesting application that comes out of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that's going to be to answer the question, how do I find the net change over time? Calculus is the study of change. And with derivatives, we talked about the rate of change. But if this, if this thing is changing at some rate that we can calculate, we should be able to figure out how much change happens over time. And there's actually a relationship between the rate of change and the net change. But before we get into that, first I want to do a quick review of some integration formulas that are very important. You should know these formulas by now. And the first one is the integral of x to the n dx. The exponent rule we should be familiar with. We just need to raise that exponent by 1 and then divide by the new exponent. Also remember that we need the plus c whenever we have an indefinite integral. We don't have limits of integration in there. We're not integrating between 5 and 7. We're just doing in general. So we're going to have a constant that could be added to our antiderivative. One uh, interesting result, though, coming out of this is the integral of 1 over x dx. We can't use the exponent formula on this because the exponent's negative 1. And if you increase that by 1, you get 0. And the formula asks us to divide by that new exponent of 0, which we cannot do. You cannot divide by 0. So we need another formula specifically for 1 over x. But what's nice is the integral is the inverse of the derivative. So we just have to ask ourselves, is there a derivative that equals 1 over x? And we should remember that the derivative of the natural log of x was 1 over x. So the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of x plus c. Speaking of natural logs, what about the exponential? What's the integral of e to the x dx? Well, you may remember from your derivative formulas, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So going backwards, the integral of e to the x is just e to the x plus the constant. A little variation on that, what would be the integral of e to the nx dx, where we've got some number multiplied by the x? Well, if you think off to the side for a minute, um, Let's move up here. When we were doing the derivative of e to the nx, we got e to the nx. And the chain rule said we had to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which was just n. So doing the integral working backwards, instead of multiplying by that n, we're going to divide by that n. We get e to the nx divided by n plus the constant. What about the integral of sine x dx? Well, again, we think about our differentiation rules. The derivative of what equals sine? Well, the derivative of cosine equals negative sine. So to account for that negative, we'll say the integral of sine is negative cosine of x plus a constant. And similarly, the integral of cosine of x dx, we know the derivative of sine is cosine. So the integral of cosine must be the sine of x plus a constant. Those formulas you should get really familiar and comfortable with taking those integrals quickly without any problem. Now, let's talk application of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that comes with the net change. And the idea of net change is if I've got some relationship or some function f of x gives the relationship between f and x. then the derivative of x 
gives the rate of change between f and x. And we saw that in Calculus 1 when we did rate of change problems. We found a relationship. We took the derivative of the relationship to determine the rate of change. Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus says we can go backwards and take the integral of the derivative between a and b, and that will give the net change in f over some interval from a to b. How much does the function change between a and b? But the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the integral of the derivative is just the function evaluated between a and b. Or more specifically, take the original function at b and subtract the original function at a. So if we want the net change over some interval, the fundamental theorem of calculus says all we have to do is just calculate the low value and the high value of the original function and subtract them. Let's take a look at an application of net change. Let's uh, see. The area of a regular triangle is the area of A, A being the side length, equals the square root of 3 over 4 times A squared, where A is the side length. We're going to write an integral to represent the net change of the area as the side increases. from 2 inches to 3 inches. Net change is the integral of the derivative. So we're taking the integral as it goes from 2 to 3 inches of the rate of change. So to do that, we're going to take the derivative of our area formula, dA or the integral from 2 to 3 of, looking at our area formula, it's just a constant times a squared. So we bring the 2 out front. It would be 2 root 3 over 4, which reduces to root 3 over 2 times a dA. This integral represents the net change. However, it's really easy to evaluate because we know we just need to plug in those limits into the original function and subtract. So really, we're taking a of 3 minus a of 2, or root 3 over 4 times 3 squared minus root 3 over 4 times 2 squared, which is equal to 5 root 3 over 4 after we simplify. So the way we calculate net change is we take the integral of the derivative. But it's easier to simplify it by just plugging in the extreme values into the original formula to calculate our net change. Let's try one more example, maybe one that's a little more general. The volume of a cylinder with height 
of 4 inches is v of r is equal to 4 pi r squared as the radius changes. The height's going to stay fixed at 4. We want to know what is the net change as the radius increases from R, capital R, to 3, capital R. In other words, the radius is going to triple. What's the net change? Well, if we wanted to make an integral, we would take an integral from those, rate, from those radiuses, from r to 3r, of the derivative of the function. Bringing the 2 out front, it gives us 8 pi r dr. But we don't really need to calculate that, because the fundamental theorem of calculus says I just have to plug these extremes into the derivative or into the integral of the derivative, which is the original function. So doing that, we get 4 pi times the top number, 3r squared, minus 4 pi times the bottom number, r squared. 9 minus 1 is 8 times 4 is 32 pi r squared is how much the volume is going to increase by a net change in the volume when the radius triples. Net change. Another nice application that we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus for comes from physics, physics with a p. And that is the relationship between acceleration, velocity, and displacement. Displacement is how much you move. Velocity is how fast you move. Acceleration is how that speed is changing. And those are all related by integration. If we know the acceleration with respect to time, then the velocity with respect to time is just going to be the integral of the acceleration dt. And the displacement with respect to time is going to be equal to the integral of the velocity with respect to time. As we do these integrations, though, we end up with a plus c or plus a constant. And what's really nice about velocity is the c will be the initial velocity. And with the displacement, the c will be the initial uh, height or position. So for example, uh, we know that gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Gravity is really acceleration. Acceleration. How fast things are moving towards the Earth. They're speeding up at 9.8 meters per second squared. So if that's true and a ball is thrown up vertically at 18 meters per second from a height of 3 meters, 
we should be able to calculate when does the ball hit the ground. When we're talking about the ball hitting the ground, we're talking about the location, the displacement, how much has it moved. And so we need to derive that displacement formula. But now we can. Starting with the acceleration of the ball, actually, let me match the colors here. I'll do this in brown. The acceleration of the ball is going to be affected by gravity, negative 9.8 meters per second. The velocity, then, is simply going to be the integration of that acceleration. I should put that in brown. Try and color code this. The integral of the acceleration dt. Well, that's just a constant. So we end up with negative 9.8t plus a constant. But that constant is going to be the initial velocity or the initial speed at which the ball is moving. It's moving up positively at 18 meters per second. And now we have an equation for the velocity. For the displacement, or the position, we take the integral of the velocity equation, the negative 9.8t plus 18 dt. Well, with the t, it becomes t squared. And then we divide by 2. Negative 9.8 divided by 2 is negative 4.9 plus 18t plus a constant. The constant, again, is that initial position. That initial height is 3. And now we have a formula that we can use to calculate when the ball hits the ground at a height of 0. Well, we'll use the good old quadratic formula to solve for t, then. The opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. And if I were to plug that into my calculator, be careful with parentheses around the numerator and the denominator. And depending on the calculator you have, possibly in the square root as well. 1 time is negative. But we do end up with a positive 3.83 seconds. And so this ball is going to take 3.83 seconds to reach its maximum height and then come crashing down to the ground. So these have been some applications of the fundamental theorem of calculus allowing us to integrate using the derivative and the relationship between the two, net change and these physics applications. So go ahead and take a look at the homework assignment, practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. We will see you in class.